massive and unprecedented growth uh, in Penrith, in the Hills area, in Blacktown Council, and uh, people feel very fretful about what that means for the character of this area. When we survey people, we consistently um, hear back from people that the things that they value the most are the environment and the heritage and the semi-rural amenity of the Hawkesbury. So you've got all this growth happening around us. And then people think, well, what does that mean for us? Yes. The state government gives us growth targets, the number of houses that we should be building. And, you know, in adjacent areas, it could be in the tens of thousands. And we recently had a revised figure given to us. And it was, I think it was something like, don't quote me, it could have been around 1,600 uh, over an extended period of time. Yes. But the point being is that the amount of growth that we're expected to sustain is significantly less than the LGAs around us. Why is that? Because there are these natural constraints that, you know, in a sense, thank God, nobody can get around. The floodplain means that you can't build on beneath a certain level, or one in 100 levels. When you get up into the hills, there are bushfire risks that mean that you, you shouldn't be building in areas that are densely forested because of the because of the uh, the fire risk. And I think that's the saving grace of the Hawkesbury. Now, that doesn't mean that there are people who want very much to push very hard for as much development as that they can possibly get through. And I invite anybody that's been regularly caught up in the congested traffic between Richmond and North Richmond and up Bell's Line of Road, and especially over the weekend and on Friday. I mean, when that bridge closes, it was an absolute nightmare. I hear that people were waiting two, three, and four hours yep. to get, you know, from Windsor through to, say, Currug. Yep. And that was just awful. Now imagine thousands and thousands of extra houses built over the river. We know that we can't sustain that. It's not enough to simply point to a parcel of pleasant green land that might have farms or equine uses and then to say, well, look, you know, that's that's level enough. We can put a house there. There's a lot more that we need to take into account. And the local press have been mentioning recently about, you know, formal and informal proposals that have come to council. We can speak about the formal ones. So the one like Belmont Park. Yes. Belmont, Belmore Park, Belmont Park that was uh, next to St John of God. I invite anybody to just go up to St John of God. It's a lovely little place with these historic buildings built along the ridge line and the beautiful green rolling hills falling off to either side, somebody wanted to put, you know, a couple of thousand houses there. And I think most people would recoil from that as an inappropriate use of that land. People know about um, the Hambledon Park proposal that's on the terrace. So if you head up towards North Richmond, hang a right at the lights, go along North Richmond, you know, yep. towards Glossadia on the left-hand side, here's a parcel of land that's been bought by a developer called Celestina. They want to put thousands of houses there. That's in the public domain. The, the DA hasn't been presented yet, but everybody knows that that's the, the, the level of intensity of development that's being proposed. And the statistic that I frequently quote is that 98% of housing pressure in New South Wales is caused by overseas migration. Now, I, I, am, I am the descendant of migrants myself. But there has to be a point where we say our infrastructure can't cope. And like Bob Carr had the prescience to ask over 20 years ago, when is Sydney full? And it seems to me that yeah. Carr's successes in the state Labor government have ceased to ask that question. It doesn't seem to be a sensible question to ask, when is Sydney full? Yeah. And when do we really start to lose those things about living in the Sydney Basin, especially here at the fringes where we have farmland and equine lands and gar market gardens and all the rest of it and passive and recreational spaces. When do we start to lose those to the extent that we've, we've, we've lost what it is that made the Hawkesbury so special to live in in the first place? And I think I and most people have a reasonable concern. I'm not against appropriate development. It's just that so much of what's being proposed and pushed sometimes in a clandestine fashion by developers and their lobby groups is inappropriate development. And, you know, I, I would prefer to see um, the resource that we have to build houses to, to serve the, the residents and families of the Hawkesbury first. So many young people can't uh, live in the communities that they grew up in because they're being priced out of 
yeah. market. They can't afford to rent. They certainly can't afford to buy. And 98% of the houses that are being built are being built to service the crushing pressures of this overseas migration. So my call is that we should you know, curtail migration until the infrastructure has a chance to catch up. And it would appear that you know some people, rather belatedly, are catching on to this message. Um, but you know, really, Labor and Liberal together have been jointly the parties of massive migration and massive development for too long. And the people that have been sounding the alarm are people with a more independent mind. Yeah, and that's true. Like the independents bring a voice of reason, and it's also because of our federal economy that we've been hooked on migration to bring in money. That's what brings in the money to fund projects. And as you said, we've now got overstretched resources with the roads. Like you look at Box Hill, we've got spray seal roads as main arterials mm. for these housing developments, which only probably less than five years ago were still rural lands. Mm. And then on top of that, you've got things like um, Naziv Developments who bought the land at Brox Hill to have the shopping centre, who's gone liquidated and he's disappeared over Lebanon. Now they've got no facilities like shopping centres for these hundreds of houses that are built there. Yeah, and too often these developments were promised with sweeteners like that. Yes. There will be bus interchanges, there will be shopping centres, there will be childcare, but you're relying on the market to provide that. All a council can really do is zone land for that purpose. So all of those people that bought into um, property at Redbank were promised that there'd be a range of benefits yeah. And the most significant one, the bridge across the Gross River, ha hasn't appeared. Under the terms of the original VPA, that should have that bridge should have been open by now. Yeah. But there's been delay after delay. The milestones have been moved again and again and again. And now it's going to be at least another two or three years, I'm guessing, before we see shovels in the ground or that project completed. Similarly, people that bought into development at Pitt Town were promised by developers out there that there would be a variety of pleasant community infrastructure, playing fields, community halls, a river walk, a riverine walk, a boat ramp at the end of Punt Road. Very little of that has been has appeared. You know, re repairing Pit Town Road, uh, upgrading Mulgrave Station car park. None of these things have happened because the developer at a certain point says, I, I can't afford this, or you know, I'm insolvent, or I'm walking away from this, and the community are left. So. Whenever a development is proposed, I think it's very wise for people and uh, elected representatives like myself to be very sceptical about the sweetness that are being offered along the way because they either take a decade longer than we expect to appear or they never appear. Well, in saying that, like you had Barry Colbert when you were talking about the, I think it was housing development plans that were going on and he said, we can't allow market forces to fix this problem. Now, going back, we're talking in the 40s and 50s, you had Robert Menzies that had a, a national housing incentive scheme, which my grandparents could have bought their house, which was a housing commission house at Black at Bankstown mm -hmm. for a cheaper discounted rate. And the money that they'd been paying through the housing commission was given to them. Now, in the 80s, when my parents, or sorry, my parents bought their house at Springwood in the 1970s. But during the 80s, I, we moved to Southland Shire and there was Lancom, which was once again another state uh, based property developer. Do you think that we need to sort of, and I know this is going to be the hard part because it will eat at a lot of both Labor and Liberal property developers' profit margins, do we need to come back to a government developer? Um, people talk about compassionate capitalism. I mean, I spent over 30 years as a member of the Liberal Party and hand on heart, I believe in markets and their ability to solve a myriad of, of problems. It, it literally is the tide that lifts all boats. But markets fail, and markets are subject to all kinds of failures, such as monopoly powers or vested interests or the skewing of public policy by lobbyists, and there's a role to kind of balance that. And I think the kind of political system that we've evolved in Australia or in the West has two parties, one of which is more prone to social policy and the other one which is more prone to market policy. And the reason that they throw each other out, you know, on a regular basis is because the pendulum swings too far in one direction and then it needs some kind of correction. I do believe that there's a role for governments to play in mandating higher uh, 
um, thresholds for social housing. I think that there's a role for government in allowing people to unlock their own savings to secure the most significant asset that they will ever own, which is their house. I believe that there's a role for um, public infrastructure to be built by well-funded uh, uh, government departments. I mean, it used to be the case that if you wanted to build a road or a bridge, you sent it to the Department of Public Works that was staffed by career engineers and draftspeople and, and, and um, yeah, technical experts and construction experts that would build said road or bridge. Yeah. Now, we live in the era of public-private partnerships where the government is so leery of public debt is that they will give that right to an operator and they'll say, you, you build us our motorway and we'll give you the right to tax people for the use of that motorway for the next 100 years. Yeah, transurban. Yeah. Now, it doesn't take 100 years to pay it off, to pay it off which meant that the public are reaching into their pocket to pay a, pub, a private operator yeah. to, for the right to drive on this road, which still should be a public road, for decades after it's been paid off. Yeah. Which meant that in the long term, well, in the short term, the government's been able to get some debt off its books. In the long term, the public get a raw deal because something's built by a private operator and then they get charged through the nose into perpetuity. Yeah. That's wrong. And I think our capitalist system needs that kind of correction. You know, I, I think that some things deserve to remain in public ownership. Our utilities, our electricity, our water, our post office, you know, um, uh, our, our key infrastructure, our transport. Yeah. And that markets can only get you so far. Sometimes there are efficiencies caused when you bring competition into a market. Look at the telecommunications market. I don't think we'd have been better off if Telstra or Telecom and continued to be the only operator of telecommunications in this country. Mind you, Tosta still sucks. <laughs> and, and and that was one of the things that once it did become uh, open market and Tosta became privatised, and I can tell you this from experience, you, you and you, you yourself, you, you were one of the people that advocated for um, the Richmond Exchange mm. to be cleaned up and then... You know, uh, within a few moments, it's cleaned that, up. That really surprised me. That was that was Telstra yeah. doing the right thing for a change, because this is. I mean, here's us spending millions of dollars, literally millions of dollars, to uplift the presentation of our main streets in Windsor, South Windsor, and Richmond. Yeah. And then there's this large public structure that faces horrible. into the main street that was a complete jungle. And I was so distressed and disgusted when I got in touch with Telstra. It was with very little expectation that they would do something about it. And within a week, they had a crew out there. And not only that, I had a long conversation with the responsible person who said, we don't know why this slipped under our radar. These things should be scheduled for regular maintenance. And we promised that it will be maintained to this better standard ongoing. And here's me saying, well, locals are telling me about the fact that this garden used to be so pleasant it won awards and people had their wedding photos there because there was yeah. a lovely gazebo and there were climbing roses and stuff like that. I wonder whether a community initiative would be um, capable of, of bringing it back to that standard as a point of, of public pride. We're still trying to kind of chase into tiles there. We need the relevant permissions and council don't want to spend any money on it, but kind of stay tuned on that front. Yeah. You know, it would be lovely to get the Chamber of Commerce engaged and to get some volunteers to draw up a plan for a garden and to have some volunteers maintain it. It's a good way of building that sense of community. Yeah, and the thing was with, and I know because I used to install generators at, at Telstra, and we went from everywhere, from Cobar to Canberra to all these other places, and you can see that these Telstra exchanges were a vibrant place of employment for locals, right, who knew the local area because they had to go out into the remote areas to fix and repair uh, phone lines, that their base and their hub was their second home. So they took great deals of pride. Mm. And it was it was very disheartening and sad because I'd go into these places and they were absolutely gutted, pilfered for everything they were worth. And you could see that there was a lot of pride. Like the last one I went into was Hornsby Telephone Exchange and it still had some of its remnants left of when it was a... When it was manned by operators. Exactly. Yeah, well, the Richmond Exchange has a similar history. It's fascinating when you start digging into it, but they're largely automated. Yeah. And, and and it was one of the things that also I noticed when I was talking to a lot of the techs, when they built those Telstra exchanges, they knew the population growth. They had worked out the population growth and they would built the exchanges. Like there's one in Canberra called Lanyon and they'd made it. It's massive, but it's just an empty hall with a couple of data racks in it now, right? 
they knew the population growth was going to go up there, right? It's an outer suburb of Canberra. But what they got wrong was the actual size of the technology or as it shrunk. Yeah. Therefore, that tells me that engineers, as you said, they've got the foresight to know what the public growth or what the uh, population growth is in the area and what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, we're putting in these roads. Uh, well, we've got the roads at Jacaranda at uh, Sphinx Road. It's a space sealed road. Now you're going to start turning soil and you're going to start putting houses there. Well, in my mind, that needs to be a dual lane road. It needs to be curved and gutted. And it needs to go all the way up to, uh, what's it called, Freeman's Reach there. And it needs to have traffic lights. Mm. Because you have um, Hawkesbury High and Freeman Reach Public School there at 3.30 on a, on a Friday afternoon. That's going to be busy. No one's going to be able to go. It's going to become even more congested. Um, and, yeah, that kind of planning, sadly, is, is hard to do. I mean, we in the Chamber were presented with the... Uh, the mini LEP that governs the development in, in that Glossadia Jacaranda estate. And the first thing I noticed is that the roads, some of the roads, the narrowest of the roads were so narrow, uh, I wondered how anybody could live or move through that space. Cite as an example what happened at Jordan Springs, where they built a development and the roads were so narrow, garbage trucks couldn't navigate down the street on Garbo night to pick up the bins because people park on people yeah. park on the curb maybe if there's a roll curb that could be one wheel one on one wheel off but that's very messy i said we've got one opportunity to get this right can we please make those roads wider i mean it might lower the yield and profitability for the developer a little bit but we're not we're not planning here for their maximum profit we're planning here to build a community that's livable we've got to have roads where we understand this is a car dependent society an average family with, you know, two adults and two kids are going to have four cars in their driveway or on the street. That's lamentable, but it's the way we live. If you don't plan an estate with that in mind yeah. and then wonder why your garbage trucks can't navigate down the road on Garbo night to pick up the bins, then it's our fault because we didn't have the common sense to plan for that now. Yeah. Now, I must say, you, you these, these conversations, whenever I go on radio, I always get asked about things that are way, way outside the um, my pay grade as a local government councillor. And the thing that I didn't get the opportunity to say is that when I appear on this, on shows like this, I'm only offering my own opinions. I'm not council's official spokesperson. So I always have to kind of throw in at some point that uh, I'm only offering my own opinions. Yeah, all that, that's true. Um, we might just pause it there and we'll take a, um, a message from our sponsor because they're the ones that keep the lights on for us. Welcome back to Hawkesbury Radio Online. And as we spoke about just prior to that, I was going to ask Nathan, uh, do you think there are certain families that have influence over both at major parties that work together? <laughs> now, I'm going to hold just before. When the uh, Hawkesbury uh, Council Watch page, mm -hmm. and now just before the mayoral minute, and it was a few weeks later, I was like scratching my head, why is she bringing this in such urgently? Because you... They, your partner had put forward a couple of things and Danielle Wheeler had made a comment, but there was a certain uh, Labor family called the Brax who made a comment who supported Patrick Connolly. And I was like, hang on, wait a second. You guys are on the other side of the spectrum and you're quite a powerful family in that group and here's another powerful family supporting each other. Mm -hmm. Why are you? Why, why are the two families so? Uh, well, well, why are these these so groups you, scared? You've asked a perceptive question, but it's one where we need to kind of pick our way through this carefully. So let me see if I can I, I can do this. We live in an area where down here in the Hawkesbury, it's pretty blue ribbon liberal. I mean, it's, it's it's a fairly safe assumption to say that a majority of people vote liberal, which is why it's a safe safe state liberal seat. That's correct. And we've also evolved into this position where local government seems infected by the same virus. I mean, you've only got to go back 20 years. I did a little chart, you know. How many elected representatives of parties were in the Hawkesbury Chamber going back into time? So more than 20 years ago, there weren't any party political representatives. Then you got people that might have been the member of a party but didn't stand under that banner to be elected because they had their own story to tell. They had enough profile to get elected. But everyone knew they were then you had party political involvement in a formal way 
And now we have nine, count them, nine out of 12 councillors that are affiliated with a political party. You've got your minor parties like the Greens or Small Business or Shooters, Fitness, Farmers. Fair enough. Then you've got the Labor Liberal Bloc. Now, people, I think, tend to vote Labor or Liberal in a very tribal way. The social demographer Bernard Salt said that in Australia, all politics is local and all politics is tribal. Yeah. So it's less ideology. And I've held a maxim in my own life that competence trumps ideology. We don't mind what a person's stripe is, red or blue, regardless of you know whether they can execute, whether they can deliver good and competent government and they're decent human beings. What's happened of late for people that do care about whether there is some you know, difference in the position, the worldview of Labor or Liberal, is that they've merged. And it's, a, it's an arrangement of convenience. You need, in a chamber of 12, six to have the casting vote or seven to have an absolute majority, and that allows you to populate committees, secure the positions of mayor and deputy mayor, and effectively lock other people out of being involved and having their voices heard. And I might add, these are the voices that people, you know, were elected to represent in the chamber. And it was long recognised that the Libs and the Labor Party independently didn't have a majority. But if they worked together, they could stitch up the position of mayor and deputy mayor. And then, you know, spend a term kind of swapping between the two. So I've been on council for eight years. We had a, an independent mayor, Mary Lyons Bucket, for two. Uh, and then we had a succession of Labor and then Liberal mayors. And, you know, people are welcome to judge. I, I won't cast dispersions, but I'll say... People are welcome to judge whether they feel that the council has been collegiate, effective, competent, civil, um, thought through whether policy is led by the best ideas for the community or whether it's whether people's opposition or support for a proposition comes purely on the basis of who's advancing it yeah. and their political stripe. So Barry Calvert was the mayor, then Patrick Connolly was the mayor, then and then uh, Sarah was the mayor, and... Uh, you know, I, I now that I'm an independent and I feel unshackled, I, I proudly stand by my conservative heritage. In an area that largely votes liberal, I can put my hand on my heart and to say, my core principles, my values have not changed. But I think that it's very difficult to get people to pay attention to, to good local government. Of course, you know, it's not as glamorous as the other two tiers of government. What do we deal with? Roads, rates and rubbish. <laughs> yeah. But... The, the decisions that local government makes have real, real impact on the quality of our life, when and how much development that we tolerate and what support we give to local childcare and what parks and libraries and pools and other amenities we provide for the communities and other services that we support, like peppercorn for aged care yeah. and so on and so on and so on. And the list goes on. It's, it's, it's longer than people think. And... and you know, if it's hard to get people to pay attention to good government, I think one of the things we can agree on is that we see, we know bad government when we see it. Correct. We know bad government when we see it. And I have to say that after eight years on council, council is dysfunctional, council is fractured, council is toxic. Yeah. The dynamics between people are toxic. And that comes as an expression of the leadership that, that that's expressed from the top. Well, the, the, what I'm looking at here and what I'm saying is that Sarah's not in competition on ideologies or policies she's in competition on a street a schoolyard bully populist sort of mantra which means that good policies get pushed away and you're seeing with it and the pattern that i'm seeing is every time mary bucket lyon danielle wheeler yourself put out a motion this is the play, this is how it plays out in my mind and you can see how it goes they straight away shut it down by Amanda Cotlash leading out with an objection. Now, you snookered her the other uh, month, and it was fantastic to watch. And Amanda was left holding the bag because Amanda had pushed out for the... Uh, and it was it's against unions and Labor's ideologies that she wanted to hide because of the figures of staffing numbers in council. All right, then. So let, let's explain this for the benefit of listeners who aren't up to speed. So at the end of a council term... There are certain statistics that come out, but some of them come out too late to kind of do any good to help voters cast an informed vote. And um, uh, Mary Lyons Bucket brought a motion before the chamber to say, look, there's an election happening in September. We'd like a summary, please, from staff uh, that, that, that tells us 
how many people have been employed, what the turnover rate is. That addresses anecdotal uh, suggestions that have been made that you know council is a difficult place to work, and you know whether whether, whether people are leaving, whether that represents a, a bleeding of our brains trust in council, and there are statistics that can be cited publicly to kind of allay those concerns. It genuinely surprised me that Councillor Cotlash opposed that because it's simply a transparency measure. Fair. And a again, the point that I made in the chamber was that at the end of the previous term, Councillor McMahon, then Councillor Richards, brought an almost identical motion, which was universally supported. So this shouldn't have been opposed as some kind of stunt. It was simply an effort to get data into the public domain because it's so hard to get people to pay attention to their local council. Um, in the same way, this Facebook group that's operating now, Hawkesbury City Councillor Watch, I have an association with them. It's run by my partner. It, I found it absolutely amazing that the mayor would bring a mayoral minute opposing or, or, or denigrating the existence of this page whose sole purpose was to bring statistical data to the public in an accessible way about who turns up, what their attendance rate is, and who votes for what. And if there are patterns, you know, if this, you know, if Labor consistently votes with the Liberals, you know, so much that there's, you know, if you squint, you can't tell the difference between them anymore. Yeah. That's worth people, people aren't going to pay attention to that. They're not political junkies, you know, every day of the week. But prior to an election, you can grab them by the shirt and you can say, this is worth paying attention to. It's Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Maybe there's an alternative. Maybe there are independents that lean right of centre or left of centre that accord with your political views that will do a, a more honest job, which will do a more diligent job, who will turn up, yep. who are not constantly inflicted with conflicts of interest that take them out of the chamber for, for one reason or another. And I thought that, that it was legitimate to kind of bring that data into a public forum. Well, the mayor made it abundantly clear that she hates that kind of accountability. And there are other councillors that spoke against that kind of accountability as well. And again, I leave it before the voters of the Hawkesbury as to whether they think that's a good thing or not. It's, it, to me, you need to, for, for, for democracy to thrive, the government needs to be held to account and scrutiny. Mm. Now, scrutiny for that is that the mayor shuts out the Hawkesbury Post. She shuts out, and she's attacking your Facebook page. She shuts me out, and I've tried a couple of times and basically told to go away. The mayor is famous for blocking anybody yeah. that, that makes any kind of negative comment or, or simply asks a reasonable question. I discovered that the mayor had blocked my mother. Who, oh, God. Who, 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 who never comments. She, she, my mother is a social media, media maven. She, she might like one of my posts because she's my mum. Yeah, he said what mums do. not going to engage in, in pointed questions or no. incrimination. And it turns out that the mayor even, you know, you know, unilaterally and preemptively blocked my mother. And I'm thinking, why? This this kind of toxicity is precisely what we want to get rid of. Exactly. I mean, there's there's nastiness circulating about me locally. And and I'm thinking, who who gets off on 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 putting about nasty nasty material when, you know, I work a full time job, I'm a school teacher. I lead a full and fulfilling life. Uh, you know, I have a cat and, and and I just want to be a good representative for the local area. And then there are people who who occupy their time, you know, producing bile or defamatory material about me and putting it around. And, you know, it back I must say, it backfires massively because everybody that says, Oh, did you see this? I was so angry and they're angry on my behalf. And they're yeah. suddenly very protective and, and even more supportive than they were beforehand. And I'm saying, well, look, there's there's nothing about this culture that can't be cured with an election, and that's true. Like, and I call that when they're angry for you, I call it the Sir Galahad uh, instinct because they're 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 charging off their white steed to go, no, that is that is injustice. And Australia, we have a deep sense of justice for things like that. And when people are doing things like that to another person, it is actually bullying. And you know, having Sarah talk about being bullying on a on a Facebook page that says uh, facts and figures, as you said about who's voted for what, where, when, it's now saying to me, oh, you want to suppress competition. You just want to have basically a dictatorship of the go local government. And anyone that says anything else corresponding, you're going to shut them out. Mm. And that's not what Australia's about. And we're a democracy. And it isn't as though there isn't a huge list of things that the chamber could be attending to. Exactly. If it wasn't engaged in this kind of point pointless bickering. I mean, our LEP 
is now years overdue. Our, our key planning document oh. that has all kinds of improvements to the way that we, you know, direct the kind of uh, society that we're creating here in the Hawkesbury. You know, uh, many people come up to me and they're saying, I want to, I want the ability to build a granny flat on my acreage property. And at the moment, the zoning won't permit me to do so. Never mind that people in Bly Park or Hobartville can build a granny flat on their tiny little house block. People that have got 10 times as much space mm. on an acreage property currently can't build yeah. a granny flat or a secondary dwelling. The new LEP has provisions to allow people to do precisely that. Why was it delayed? Because we had dispatched it to Gateway at the end of the previous term. The new chamber was seated. And the first thing that they did is pull it back up on the blocks. It's like they've launched a boat, but they've now tried to pull it back up into the dock to, you know, poke at it. And it's created this years-long delay. That document could have been finished and finalised by now. We could have been doing a better job to to present a united face instead of this kind of megaphone diplomacy that we're doing at the moment about flood mitigation. Yeah. I mean, you know, to give the mayor credit for something, whenever we have a flood, it brings back into focus the fact that there are no major capital programs being mooted to mitigate flooding. And we were promised that by the previous government. And then the Labor Party got elected uh, over a year ago, promising to have a new or, or, or a more balanced property. And they've come up with squat. So we are right as the local government representing the people that are squarely in the bullseye of that kind of risk to say, here is another flood. When are you going to get off your asses and do something about this? Yeah. And the, the, you know, but we're not going to achieve that by, you know, going on Sky News and, no. and haranguing the, the, the Premier on, 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 on the day that his father dies. Yeah. And, and you're not going to do that by shouting from a distance and with recrimination. You know, I learn at the feet of, of politicians that are far wiser and far cannier is that it's the quiet conversations. It's the back channels. It's the quiet negotiation. Look at what happened with the Lower Portland Ferry. Yes. Uh, I, I know you probably won't want to say too much about this, but let, let <laughs> yes. me summarise the situation like this. We're a safe Liberal seat yes. that has very little in the way of leverage over a state Labor government. And to ask a state Labor government to take on the responsibility of that ferry, the Lower Portland Ferry, was told to me for many years to be an utterly impossible ask. Mm. And yet it happened. And it was a Labor government that did it. Well, I hear along my grapevine that it was because people had quiet conversations with the people that do have leverage with the state government, in mm -hmm. unions, yes, the NUA, and that's what got it done. Now, that wasn't achieved with a megaphone on Sky News. That was done because people had conversations and knew where that point of leverage were. That represents good government. And, and it's uh, to say how that happened, it's a, a term that my grandfather used to use, and it was in a book written by uh, Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And it was a 1930s book. And my grandfather used to say to me, you, you catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. Mm -hmm. And as I got older, I've got a little bit more... Uh, I've added an annex to it. You catch more flies with honey and bullshit than you do with vinegar and venom. And, and the mayor's going with um, with vinegar and venom. Now, there are some times where you've got to have that quiet conversation and you've got to accept some people's bullshit. And I apologise for swearing for anyone as a bit, but that's, that's how it is. Um, because you just have to go, yep, but as long as you achieve your objective... Mm -hmm. And this is coming from a tradie background and, and being in the Air Force. As long as you achieve your objective, who cares? And at the end of the day, that's brought back in. Now, I know in the grapevine that the MUA wants to get rid of, um, was it Burden? And they were the ones that caused a massive strike. And that will take some time because they've got... A burden is a, a ferry operator, has a lot of influence... And if you go into their history with Burden, it is absolutely amazing to see them at the FWC, the Fair Work Commission, and they just have case after case after case after mm -hmm. case after case. And to see um, that sort of publicity stunt down there with Weissman's Ferry absolutely gutted me because people had to go around the other way, all this sort of stuff. Mm. And it, it was like, are you guys trying to help out the community there? You know, dialogue, as I said, bring it back to honey and bullshit to work with it. It wouldn't have been a problem. But no, Burden just, they, because they, they are, they're a family company and they supply boats to 
uh, the American uh, Coast Guard. They also supply boats to the Australian Navy. So they've got a fair political pull. Yeah. They're just trying it on and they're just going to use it for a political exercise, which then, once again, it affects the community. We need to have uh, outcome-driven sort of situations. And once again, the other one that was really was good was to watch everyone come together for the Nurses and Midwives Association. You, Pulse FM, us, Hawkesbury Post, um, we all came together. And that was an achieved objective, that those people got all their conditions transferred off. Mm. And it was fantastic. You've got to be able to sit down and you've got to be able to negotiate in good faith without, you know, becoming obsessed with the labels that people come with. Exactly. And, you know, I think we've lost that ability locally. And again, that's just a failure of leadership. And, you know, uh, our council has so many issues that beset us. We're caught between two stools. We're not a metropolitan council in the sense that metropolitan councils manage a fraction of the amount of roads that we have to. Correct. And we're not a country council, which which means that we, we, we're not eligible for certain pots of money that would otherwise be we'd be eligible for. And, you know, everybody listening in knows that the number one issue before us is the state of our infrastructure and particularly roads. Our roads are in a shocking state. Yeah. And we've got to be very upfront with people and to say, we have a certain rate base. We have a certain amount of money that we take in through rating. And it's a, it's a fiction to think that we're going to improve that rate base by doing massive new urban development and that that'll bring in rivers of gold. Of course, it costs us money. Yeah, exactly. You know, the amount that it costs ratepayers elsewhere in the Hawkesbury to buy land for infrastructure to develop, say, Vineyard Stage 1 yeah. would, 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 would shock most people. And people would say, why am I putting my hand into my pocket so that the council can develop this land? And the, the amount of rating income that we get back doesn't not, will never match that. So there's that. Then we're heavily dependent. I mean, you know, close to half our income comes from outside sources, grants from other tiers of government, which is federal and state assistance grants. And if you look at the percentage of federal assistance grants that the federal government gives the local government sector as a whole, that fell from uh, about 1% of all federal taxation revenue in the mid-1990s and in the nearly 30 years that have elapsed since then, uh, that percentage has dropped to 0.45%. So it's it's dropped by more than half. We get less than half the support from the federal government. Now, the federal government would say, no, you do get some of that money back, but it's packaged up and tied up with different kinds of bows. But yeah. we know that the local government sector is massively under-resourced. So yeah. we are constantly behind the eight ball in funding the upkeep to our key infrastructure, including roads, and... That meant that a few years ago, there was a need to ask for a special rate variation. But here's the problem. That rate variation was put to the people with a whole heap of sweeteners. You know, well, if you allow us to lift everybody's rates by a third, yep. we're going to do all kinds of capital improvements to various roads, including, say, Packer Road. Yes, well. well. Packer Road, dragged its heels, dragged its heels, finally came back to the chamber only earlier this year. And that We came to within a whisper. We came to within a hair's breadth of abolishing that project altogether. The recommendation in the business paper from staff was to abandon Sealing Packer Road. And we made a pledge yeah. to people that along with the special rate variation that we would seal Packer Road. It's only because I and others held the view that we had to keep our promise in the chamber that we managed to kind of hold on to that. And now, it's, in, it's it's good, that's the yeah. environment. How is it going to be when council's finances are so powerless and that we're so far behind on our infrastructure backlog is that we've got to ask for another special rate variation. And I'm telling you, that is not entirely unlikely in the next term of council. We're being presented figures that show us that council's infrastructure backlog is getting worse. Yep. We don't have the revenue to fix it. And the only thing that we're going to be able to do to try to fix that is to ask for another rate hike. And people are going to come back to council and they're going to say, well, it's not as though we aren't prepared to pay more and that we accept your argument that, you know, you, you need to be properly resourced to fix the roads, but you didn't do what you said you were going to do the exactly. last time when you raised our taxes only five years ago. Exactly. So why should we trust you this time? It's about trust. It's about that sense of buy-in. It's about the sense that council is working for you and is being represented by people that you've elected rather than being run by a cabal, a committee, uh, operating out of the local Liberal Party or Labor Party 
who simply want to give out those positions on council as a sinecure, depending on who's your mate or, you know, what what other thing that you want to get out of local government. And it's one of those things with the local government, like you were saying, the Packer Road, and I was in that chamber that night, and to be there with that young girl who, uh, young girl's mother, mm -hmm. that, that struck me because in the Hawkesbury, we have a high rate of fatalities mm. among teenage drivers. Mm. It is ridiculous. And my barber was telling me about his sons and the attitude towards it. But this young girl wasn't driving silly. It was just poor road conditions. Now, after that, I went up and down that road in my work truck. Mm. And I, I could see how it would be poorly maintained and how frightening that would have been for that young girl mm. in the last moments of her life that that would have happened. And that was, that's something that as a councillor and as the mayor, I would have assumed as a mother, she would have moved heaven and earth. But here's the other thing. She was very right in what she said a few weeks ago with her other mayor and winner, where she said, where Sarah said, cost shifting. And we need to put that cost shifting back. And that's where the, the lower Portland ferry came into mind and, and other things that the council should be doing. And, he, he, and we spoke earlier about the roads and tolls. Now, tolls on roads used to be, used to be given back to local councils a little bit to upkeep local council roads. Oh, like the fuel levy and like uh, a yeah, exactly. like, like, uh, fine levy. Exactly. But we've removed those things. They go off into other uh, infrastructure projects oh. and we're left with the worst, like, worst roads. Mm -hmm. And we need to sort of start bringing that back because they were working. And we're making vested interests like Transurban money. And they're sending it offshore into tax havens and we're not getting our money back out of it, let's be honest. No, that system, I mean, I agree, that system is broken. Yeah. But it's also well above the pay grade of local <laughs> government <laughs> council. Although, you know, it's good for councils to band together. It's, it's good for council yeah. laws to be across these issues. And it's good for councils to band together. And one of the things that came up at our last meeting was, you know, how do we stand together with like-minded council. We're exactly. already a member of an organisation called Wedrock, yep. which is a Western Sydney regional organisation of councils that's been operating since 1973. And then there were all of these other groupings that were created with, you know, the high-minded intent of the, the, the previous state and federal governments, you know, the Greater Sydney Commission, the Western Parkland City. And what we're trying to pick our way through is whether this represents an unnecessary duplication it was certainly the view yeah. of Barry Calvert that this represented an unnecessary duplication and that Wesrock, which we're already a member of, adequately uh, represents the interests of Western Sydney councils in a way that we alone could not. Yeah. And now there's this other grouping and does it overlap? Does it complement? And it's a bit of a mess, frankly. I hate unnecessary duplication. Me me, too. This strikes me as a kind of a, an unnecessary and bureaucratic duplication. And the reason that the chamber opted in to becoming, you know, a more formal member of this other grouping is because if we didn't, we would miss out on certain pools of funding that might flow from that. So it is what it is. It, yeah. It's it's imperfect. It's a camel. <laughs> I know. Anyway, we're going to take a quick word from our sponsor, who you're going to like. It's Lollies and Stuff, who are major for what we're going to talk about next as uh, major supporters of the Gas uh, Light uh, Festival that was on that we were both at last night. And we can talk about that because it was a great night, had boil, and I think there should be more of them. All right. Yep. right. And we're back. Welcome back to Hawkesbury Radio Online, and you're with Sparky Short and Nathan Zerprogno, and we're having a great chat about off air about the Gaslight Festival, which was fantastic. And, yes. And part of the identity was that Nathan got to be dressed up as the town crier, but he's uh, taken. Uh, a day uh, day. Uh, somebody bowled up to me and said, Oh, you're the town complainer. And I said, Oh, I am totally, I am totally <laughs> stealing so that. Good. So I threw that in there. <laughs> hey, 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 as your town complainer, I mean town crier. I even, for the benefit of your listeners, this is going to muck up your your levels. I've got the bell in. Oh yeah, there you going go. Right off the charts. I've, I've, I've got my town crier's bell that uh, that Councillor Shane Jurick put together. He made this. I did. He knew I was in need of a bell, and he actually made this. Good on him. And it goes to show there were so many people that pulled together the committee from the Windsor Experience Group and the Windsor Business Group, who, who seem to just have this incredible passion and heart for showcasing our most historic township yeah. to tourists and locals alike 
and to say there's something really special. I mean, this area was, you know, it's been settled since 1790. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Proclaimed by Macquarie in 1810. We have beautiful historic buildings. We've got our mall. We've got our gas lanterns. We've got Thompson Square. We have history coming out of the wazoo. And, 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 you know, council is, you know, I think often reluctantly dragged along in appreciating just how special this area is and you know, council did come to the party. They've they've helped refurbish the gas lamps. They've they've they're funding the refurbishment of Windsor Mall. They sponsored uh, last night's event to the tune of five thousand dollars and good on them. And uh, just to see that joyous mix of people dressing up. I was there in my tricorn hat and my big blue velvet coat yeah. as the town crier. But we had a a, a night. Nice, I asked him if he was the knight who said, Nick! <laughs> yeah, so, he gets, so he gets away this, this passive silence. Uh, you know, people dressed in top hats and coattails. Yeah. And we had uh, Sean, uh, we had um, Shane dressed up as our as our gasketeer, the, the gas lighter. And it was just wonderful. And I know that many people wanted dearly to come along, but were prevented by the closure of the North Richmond Bridge. There is, I hope, I think that this could become an annual event on the June long weekend. Yes. You know, Gas Lamp Festival. Uh, it was a wonderful time and I was honoured to be asked to participate in it. And, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a history teacher. I'm qualified as a history teacher. So this kind of thing floats my boat. I've got my own family history with the area that goes back to the Third Fleet. And I just thought it was fantastic. I, 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 I came there totally underdressed. I felt a bit, <laughs> came in there with a fluoro hoodie on and my wife came there with her red jacket on and we were like, oh. and I'm like, I so want to dress up. And like, we could have like, cause we had Hendrix with us as well. We met Hendrix. Um, I'm like, next year I'm going to dress up, but we've got Winterfest coming up. Are you going to go I, into that? I, I, I always go to Winterfest. I, I used to go to Ironfest up at Lithgow. Oh yeah. And I dressed up, I had a pith helmet and I grew mutton chops and I went as like, you know, kind of like a Jumanji type figure. <laughs> uh, and, and that was always good fun. Um, I, I believe that somebody called you a troll and that maybe the most appropriate costume for you would be a tr- uh, to go as a troll. I am definitely, that's, well, uh, my wife will be going as a witch. Hendrix will be going as our little dragon. He's, we've already got the dragon jumpsuit. It's fantastic. And I will definitely be getting some green paint, an extended nose. Maybe I, I'm going to have to grow my beard out until between now and, so I've got a month to do it. So I lean, 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 lean into it. Lean into it. Let the hair go. <laughs> Poor John the barber is not going to be too happy with me. Yeah. But I mean... Thanks have to be given to uh, Councillor Jurek, Shane, uh, Shane Jurek, uh, Gay Kelly, Darren Peen, and all of the members of the Windsor Experience Group Committee who worked so hard under difficult circumstances to make it all happen. And it turned out to be a triumph. It, it was. It was a fantastic night. And it was good because, as I was saying earlier in the show, it was quite sad because I went up to Windsor at about 11 because I don't read things properly sometimes. And I was like, oh, where's the window experience? There should be bands and stuff playing. And nah, there was no one. And it was a bit dead during that like, during the day. It was like 5 to 12. And I'm like, oh, got wrapped up. It was an evening thing. Yeah, it was yeah. an evening thing. And I was like, oh, I feel so sorry for these people in the local businesses. I'm like, oh. And then when I saw it, I was like, good. There's people there. And then the same thing with the people this weekend who, who are, this is their bread and butter time where they're going to make money. Mm. And we need to support those tourism things. And we need to get that up in place. Mm. And we get that more right. Western Sydney Airport, we're right on the heartland going up to the, the Hunter Valley wine tours and all that sort of stuff. We've got our own wine tours and it's, 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 I, you know, I, it's I, 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 as a councillor and as a person who's grown up in the district, I won't let people be down on the Hawkesbury. People who think this is, you know, this, this sleepy and undeveloped backwater, that's our, that's our charm. We're Sydney's playground. Yeah. We're Sydney's uh, bread basket. Yep. We're, we're, we're Sydney's you know, oxygen, you know, this is where people come to unwind and appreciate the history and the heritage and um, do some shopping and, you know, have a have a break and get away. And I think many people envy us for what we have in the Hawkesbury. I only wish that we had the capacity to value it better ourselves. Yeah, and, and that's, that's the problem. Like, we're, it's 12 o'clock, we're out of time. I've got to thank you for coming in. It was fantastic to have you. Uh, always very knowledgeable. I feel very humble talking next to you because I'm like, I am not really educated enough to talk to this guy <laughs> a lot of the time. Um, 
Sparky Sean, always a pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, and uh, I will catch up with you and look forward to seeing your work in the future. Thank you very much, Nathan Burton and uh, Zan Brogno. Thank you for to all the listeners who make it. Thank you to the sponsors that make it happen for us. And have a fantastic long weekend or what's left of it in the Hawkesbury and enjoy yourself.